Continuing our examination of the claim that the Bible shows evidence of divine inspiration, we are looking at its morality. In our previous episode we examined the moral laws laid down in the Bible, and found them mostly atrocious. Now, let's look at some examples of conduct from the top 10 heroes of the Bible. Number 10, Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Genesis 6 9. So, Noah is presented to us as a good example. He is also listed in the so-called Faith Hall of Fame in the New Testament. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, where, as we'll see, many of our top 10 heroes of the Bible are also listed. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Hebrews 11:7. According to Genesis 9:20-24, some time after the flood, Noah became drunk and his son Ham saw him lying in a naked stupor. Because of this, Noah cursed Ham's son, Canaan, to be a slave to his brothers. But, if Noah was going to lie around naked, it was his own fault if someone saw him in that condition. Ham was blameless, and Ham's son Canaan wasn't even involved in the matter. So, it was unjust for Noah to curse him into slavery, especially since Ezekiel 18.20 says that the son will not be punished for the sin of his father. What was wrong with nakedness, anyway? The God of the Bible made the prophet Isaiah walk around naked for three years, as a sign for a prophecy that failed to come true. In any case, though the Bible insists Noah was righteous, we must call condemning people to slavery unrighteous. Number 9. Abraham. In Genesis, the God of the Bible calls Abraham righteous, and promises to make him the father of many nations. And, in Isaiah, this same God is represented as calling Abraham his friend. He also receives honorable mention in the Hall of Faith of Hebrews 11. In chapters 12 and 20, Abraham cowardly tells others that Sarah is his sister, rather than his wife. This deception puts Sarah in potentially compromising situations. And it also resulted in God sending a plague on Pharaoh and his family, for being the unwitting victims of Abraham's lie. Bible apologists will point out that Sarah really was Abraham's sister, his half-sister. But, according to Leviticus 2019, such a marriage is incestuous, and carries a mandatory banishment. So, it's rather absurd to think that a God, who could make such a law would consider Abraham righteous, and promise to make him the father of many nations, the offspring of incest and adultery. In chapter 16, at Sarah's urging, Abraham takes Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian maidservant, as a concubine to bear a child, since Sarah was barren. When Sarah became jealous, Abraham agrees to cast out both Hagar and their son Ishmael, to fend for themselves, becoming one of the first dead beat fathers in history. In chapter 22 God tests Abraham's faith by commanding him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham obeys this horrendous order, fully prepared to carry out filicide via a human sacrifice to his bloodthirsty God. Bible apologists will tell us that this was just a test this jealous God conducted, to see if Abraham loved him more than he loved his son. Yet, God had already declared Abraham righteous back in chapter 15, and elsewhere the Bible tells us that this God knows the hearts of all men, and knows if people are good or bad from the womb. And, remember that we are searching for an all-knowing God. Such a God wouldn't need to conduct tests to gain knowledge, it would already possess all knowledge. Personally, I think Abraham failed the test, showing his cowardice once again by allowing his fear, this time of God, to override his love for his son. Number 8. Lot. Abraham's nephew. Lot and his family were miraculously saved by angelic intervention from the destruction of their hometown, Sodom. According to the New Testament, this was because Lot was a righteous man. Let's consider two actions of this righteous man. When a mob of horny men surround Lot's house, he steps outside and tells them, Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. Genesis 19:8. Up till now Lot's uncle Abraham has been the worst example of fatherhood, what with attempting to murder one son, 
and abandoning the other. But now the prize may have to go to Lot for offering his virgin daughters to a mob, and inviting them to do as they pleased with them. A lack of love seemed to run in that family. But wait, there's more. Lot later becomes drunk and has sex with his daughters, getting them both pregnant. Apologists will say this wasn't Lot's fault, that his daughters manipulated him, and he was too drunk to know what he was doing. Sounds just like the excuses made by pedophiles today. Number 7, Jacob, later known as Israel. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. And I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Genesis 48 3-4. In this passage, God's promise to bless him and his descendants, indicated God's favor towards Jacob. But, Jacob's father Isaac intended his blessing for his eldest son, he saw. In Genesis chapter 27 we read how Jacob lied to his father in order to obtain the blessing. After fleeing from his brother Esau, Jacob stays with his uncle Laban and works for him for 20 years. During this time, Jacob engages in a series of maneuvers to increase his own wealth and secure his own interests, often at the expense of Laban. For example, Jacob negotiates with Laban to increase his share of the livestock, and makes use of sympathetic magic to ensure that he receives the best animals. Number 6, Moses. In the New Testament, Moses is among those listed in the Hall of Faith. The God of the Bible specifically chose him to be the leader of his people. Take a look at this faithful leader in action. They fought against Midian, as the Lord commanded Moses, and killed every man. The Israelites captured the Midianite women and children and took all the Midianite herds, flocks and goods as plunder. They burned all the towns where the Midianites had settled, as well as all their camps. Moses was angry with the officers of the army, who returned from the battle. Have you allowed all the women to live? He asked them. They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in the Peor incident, so that a plague struck the Lord's people. Now kill all the boys. And kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Numbers 31 7 to 10 and 14 to 18. Let's take some time to let this pronouncement of the meekest of men sink in. He ordered his men to kill prisoners of war and civilians. Both of these acts are recognized today as war crimes under international humanitarian law, particularly the Geneva Conventions. To make matters worse, he ordered the soldiers to save the virgin girls for themselves. Moses evidently believed that interracial marriage was a sin. Yet, elsewhere in the Bible we are told that there is neither Jew nor Greek. And, in one of the most egregious examples of hypocrisy in history, the Bible tells us that Moses himself had married a Midianite woman, the daughter of the priest of Midian. Moses stated that the reason the women had to be murdered was because the Israelites had sexual relations with them. Yet he tells his men to spare the virgin women for themselves. Why do you suppose virgin women were kept alive for these men? What do you suppose these Israelite men, who seemed to fall so easily for the charms of foreign women, did with these women? Doesn't it seem that by this action Moses allowed the very thing he was railing against? According to the Bible, having sexual relations with Midianite women is what caused the plague and the war. Yet, in the end what are we left with? Thousands of people dead, and the Israelite men having sexual relations with Midianites. The Bible tells us there were 32,000 virgins which Moses told the Israelite men to keep alive for themselves. Of these, 352 were given to the priests as the Lord's tribute. What do you suppose the priests did with these women children? As it turns out, we don't have to wonder. The Bible relates that it's God gave specific orders as to what must be done with such people. Every person, animal, and piece of property that you dedicate completely is only for me. In fact, any humans who have been promised to me in this way must be put to death. Leviticus 27 28 to 29. So, after they murdered thousands of innocent men, women, and children, burned their cities, stole their property, and raped thousands of women, 
God's chosen people sacrificed 352 virgins to their God, as Moses commanded. Now, before you have nightmares about this story, know that, according to the Bible itself, it can't be a true story. In spite of being told, here, that the Israelites killed all the Midianite males, we later read of a vast multitude of Midianites overwhelming the Israelites. Bible hero number 5, Jephthah, judge of Israel. In the New Testament, Jephthah is praised as another man of faith in Hebrews 11:32. Let's see what his faith caused him to do. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed hand over to me the sons of Ammon, then whatever comes out the doors of my house to meet me when I return safely from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord handed them over to him. But Jephthah came to his house at Mitzpah, and behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. And she was his one and only child, besides her he had no son or daughter. So when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Oh, my daughter! You have brought me disaster, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. In verse 39 we are informed that the Jephthah did to her what he had vowed. Here again, just as with that other hero Abraham, a father, blinded by faith was willing to murder his own child, and is praised in the Bible for this. His daughter, who willingly assents to be another virginal burnt sacrifice to the Bible God, doesn't even get her name mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Although the Bible speaks approvingly of Judge Jephthah, the Mosaic law condemned what he did. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, Deuteronomy 18.10. Evidently, having faith takes precedence in God's judgment of lawbreakers and those who so horrendously murder their own children. Number 4, Samson, Judge of Israel. Samson was another judge of Israel who is praised as one of the men of faith in the New Testament. Samson made a foolish wager with his guests. After losing the wager, he engaged in mass murder and theft in order to pay off his gambling debt. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed thirty men of them and took what they were wearing and gave the outfits of clothes to those who told the riddle. And his anger burned, and he went up to his father's house. Judges 14 19. So, in order to pay off his foolish wager, Samson murdered thirty innocent people and gave what he stole from them to the men he had tried to swindle. If they had America's most wanted back then, this sleazebag known as Samson would be on the top of their most wanted list. But the Bible assures us that he was only able to accomplish his great crimes through the Spirit of the Lord which came upon him. After committing mass murder, and after leaving his wife, Samson assumed he could waltz back into his wife's bed by offering her a goat. Instead of kicking him out, her father generously offered Samson his younger daughter. But this didn't please him. Samson said to them, This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines, I will really harm them. So he went out and caught three hundred foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain, together with the vineyards and olive groves. Judges 15 3-5. By what moral logic did Samson conclude that he had a right to harm the Philistines? His Philistine wife had remarried after he had become a thief and a murderer and had abandoned her. What did he expect her to do? Samson, in contrast, was not only guilty of theft and murder, but also animal abuse, arson, and destruction of property. There's no telling how many people would be left to starve after Samson burned their crops. Number 3, David, King of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 13 God refers to David as a man after his own heart. In chapter 16 we are told that God himself chose David to be king. And that, after Samuel anointed him, from that day on the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. 1 Samuel 16 13. Finally, after David's death, God summed up his life in these words, My servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. 1 Kings 14 8. 
and New Testament writers were proud to call Jesus a son of David. Though, according to the Bible story of the virgin birth, Jesus could not have been in David's bloodline. Songs were sung about David having killed tens of thousands of people. Those he didn't kill he put to hard labor as slaves. David took a great quantity of plunder from the city and brought out the people who were there, consigning them to labor with saws and with iron picks and axes, and he made them work at brickmaking. David did this to all the Ammonite towns. 2 Samuel 12 30-31 in 1 Samuel chapter 25 we see David running a protection racket, demanding payment for not having stolen from Nabal. When Nabal refused to pay, David intended on killing Nabal and his sons, who were only saved by the intercession of his wife, who paid him off and groveled before him. But God killed Nabal anyway, and David married his wife, the story turning out much the same as with Bathsheba and Uriah, though God disapproved of David's action in that particular incident the main difference being that David arranged the murder without God's help. David lied to his host when he was living as the guest of the Philistine king Achish. He told the king he was warring against Judah, when in fact he was conducting raids in the very country that was harboring him, against Philistine towns. When Achish asked, where did you go raiding today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, he did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought, they might inform on us and say, this is what David did. And such was his practice as long as he lived in Philistine territory. 1 Samuel 27. David also engaged in animal abuse. David captured a thousand of his chariots, 7,000 charioteers and 20,000 foot soldiers. He hamstrung all but a hundred of the chariot horses. 2 Samuel 8 4. He committed kidnapping and false imprisonment, when David returned to his palace in Jerusalem, he took the ten concubines he had left to take care of the palace and put them in a house under guard. They were kept in confinement till the day of their death. 2 Samuel 23. He engaged in human sacrifice to appease his God. There was a famine during David's reign that lasted for three years, so David asked the Lord about it. And the Lord said, the famine has come because Saul and his family are guilty of murdering the Gibeonites. 2 Samuel 21 1. In order to rectify the situation, David agreed to hand over two of Saul's sons, and five of his grandsons, who were David's own stepsons, to be sacrificed. The men of Gibeon executed them on the mountain before the Lord, after that, God ended the famine in the land. 2 Samuel 21 9 and 14. This was another betrayal by David, who, according to 1 Samuel 24 17-21, had made a solemn vow to Saul, swearing not to harm Saul's descendants after Saul's death. Fittingly, David's last words were murderous, and another betrayal of a promise he'd made. He told his son Solomon. And remember, you have with you Shimei. I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now, do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom, you will know what to do to him. Bring his grey head down to the grave in blood. 1 Kings 2 8-9. Number 2, Jesus, Son of God. We have God's own recommendation of Jesus in Matthew 3:17, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And, the Bible tells us that Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2:22. And yet, the Bible records an instance of Jesus lying. In John chapter 7, Jesus says, You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival, because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret, John 7 8-10. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Anyone who says, You fool! will be in danger of the fire of hell. Matthew 5 22. But later in the book of Matthew, we read of Jesus calling people fools. You blind fools! Matthew 23 17. This is the epitome of hypocrisy, do as I say, not as I do. He engaged in name-calling. You snakes! you brood of vipers. 
Matthew 22:33. He made a racial slur, calling non-Jews dogs. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Matthew 15, 26. Despite claiming that God cares for every sparrow, Jesus was not ethical in his treatment of animals or environmentally conscious, he killed an entire herd of pigs as if they were of no consequence, and cursed a fig tree for not providing fruit out of season when he was hungry. Jesus disrespected his parents when his mother came to him along with his brothers, refusing to see them, and stating that his followers had become his family instead. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother, and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Matthew 12 46 to 49. And, he actually required people to hate their families in order to be a disciple of his. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Luke 14 26. I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother. Matthew 10 35. Despite being called the Prince of Peace he was not for peace, quite the opposite. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Matthew 10 34. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Luke 22 36. He, himself, engaged in violence and vandalism. So he made a whip out of cords, and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. John 2:15. In his parables he threatened those who failed to serve him, even threatening to set them on fire. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25:41. Number 1. Guess who? We've saved the best for last. To keep his identity a mystery to the end, all of the citations in this section will appear in our description. Our mystery hero is an individual in the Bible whom, we are told, is good to all and has compassion on all. We are told he is perfect. So, he is set before us as a perfect example to follow. Yet, according to the Bible, our mystery hero was guilty of all of the following. 1. Setting fire to entire cities and all of their inhabitants. 2. Selling people into slavery. 3. Ordering the killing of countless animals just so he could enjoy the smell of their burning bodies. 4. Encouraging genocide. 5. Forcing cannibalism. 6. Threatening infanticide and abortion by the sword. 7. Punishing people for the crimes of their great-grandfathers. 8. Purposely spreading a lie that resulted in someone's death. 9. Murdering someone for lending a hand. 10. Murdering people, or inflicting them with leprosy, for burning incense. 11. Promising that soldiers under his command will rape women. 12. Turning women over to a rapist to punish their husband's sin. 13. Manipulating a ruler to act in his people's worst interests, then punishing his people for it, all just to show off. 14. Arranging to have his own son tortured and murdered. 15. Purposely inflicted people with tumors and leprosy. 16. Instituting trials by ordeal. 17. Inflicting pain on women during childbirth. 18. Creating evil. Have you guessed his identity? If you said Satan the devil, that's understandable, but completely wrong. The correct answer is, the God of the Bible, also known as Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord, or simply God. As we've seen, the Bible does not demonstrate a superior morality which demonstrates a divine origin. Far from it. Many good people sincerely believe the Bible is a guidebook for our lives, espousing a pure moral teaching. 
such people must not have read the Bible objectively, cover to cover. There are a few pearls of wisdom, and an occasional golden nugget amid the horrible atrocities, immorality, and unjust laws of the Bible. But that just makes it all the more dangerous, as people can pull you into it with such lures, and before you know it you are duped into thinking that it all must be good. Then there is a whole other class of people, egoists lacking all sincerity. They haven't read the Bible either, but they attempt to make use of it. Thinking its reputation will rub off on them by association, and the admiration people misguidedly have for it will transfer to them. Not only does the Bible show no sign of being inspired, the God which the Bible depicts does not align with the God we have been trying to find a reason to believe in, the one who is all good. Therefore, the Bible cannot be used to provide evidence for such a God's inspiration or existence. We have now listened to all of the pro side of the argument for belief in the existence of God. In our next episode we will consider the con side, reasons for not believing in God.